evening and welcome back to our evening service tonight. I'll invite you to take your hymnals if you want to follow along in those to number 97. Number 97, all hail the power of Jesus' name. I invite you to stand with me as we sing all four verses of this together. Let's bow together in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ who gave us all that we might be saved, that we might know you in a personal way. Father, we thank you for all that you've done for us, that all, for all that you do for us day by day, moment by moment. May we give you the honor and the praise that is due to you because of this. Father, we look forward to that day when we can, will meet you, when we will bow at your feet. And thank you for all of those things that you've done for us. We want to thank you that we can be here tonight as we are here. We pray that we would honor you again, that we would lift your name high. Father, we pray that uh, we would draw closer to you because we've been here and closer to one another as we uh, fellowship together. We pray that it would enable us, equip us to go out in the highways and byways of life as we sang this morning that we might be a blessing because of all that you've done for us to those that we meet. May you be honored and praised tonight in this service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. We'll continue in song number 348. 348.
Pastor Scripture. I invite you to turn your Bibles to Leviticus, I think, chapter 4. Okay, I watched last Sunday night service and then I questioned myself. Leviticus chapter 4, working our way uh, week by week through Leviticus in our Sunday evening scripture reading. The first five chapters should be fairly familiar to you because we were in those chapters for five months of communion services I don't know, a year or two ago. I can't remember when it was, but just those. Once we get past chapter 5, it'll be fresh ground for us again. But tonight we are in Leviticus chapter 4. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the people of Israel, saying, If anyone sins unintentionally in any of the Lord's commandments about things not to be done, and does any one of them, If it is the anointed priest who sins, thus bringing guilt on the people, then he shall offer for the sin that he has committed a bull from the herd without blemish to the Lord for a sin offering. He shall bring the bull to the entrance of the tent of meeting before the Lord and lay his hand on the head of the bull and kill the bull before the Lord. And the anointed priest shall take some of the blood of the bull and bring it into the tent of meeting, and the priest shall dip his finger in the blood and sprinkle part of the blood seven times before the Lord in front of the veil of the sanctuary. And the priest shall put some of the blood on the horns of the altar of fragrant incense before the Lord that is in the tent of meeting. And all the rest of the blood of the bull he shall pour out at the base of the altar of burnt offering that is at the entrance of the tent of meeting. And all the fat of the bull of the sin offering he shall remove from it the fat that covers the entrails and all the fat that is on the entrails and the two kidneys with the fat that is on them at the loins and the long lobe of the liver that he shall remove with the kidneys just as these are taken from the ox of the sacrifice as you saw last week of the peace offerings and the priest shall burn them on the altar of burnt offering. But the skin of the bull and all its flesh with its head, its legs, its entrails, and its dung and all the rest of the bull he shall carry outside the camp to a clean place to the ash heap and shall burn it up on a fire of wood. On the ash heap it shall be burned up. Wow. It's detailed instructions about what to do with this animal. So you deal with its blood and you deal with its parts Eventually, you deal with its carcass. All of that is designed as a picture of what sin does to the community and what God requires to be done with sin. I'm in verse 13 now. If the whole congregation of Israel sins unintentionally and the thing is hidden from the eyes of the assembly and they do any one of the things that by the Lord's commandments ought not to be done and they realize their guilt, When the sin which they've committed becomes known, the assembly shall offer a bull from the herd for a sin offering and bring it in front of the tent of meeting. This time the elders of the congregation shall lay their hands on the head of the bull before the Lord, and the bull shall be killed before the Lord. The anointed priest shall bring some of the blood of the bull into the tent of meeting. He shall dip his finger in the blood and sprinkle it seven times before the Lord in front of the veil. He shall put some of the blood on the horns of the altar that is in the tent of meeting before the Lord, and the rest of the blood he shall pour out at the base of the altar of burnt offering that is at the entrance of the tent of meeting. And all its fat he shall take from it and burn on the altar. Thus shall he do with the bull, as he did with the bull of the sin offering, so shall he do with this. And the priest shall make atonement for them, and they shall be forgiven, He shall carry the bull outside the camp and burn it up as he burned the first bull. It is the sin offering for the assembly. Verse 22, when a leader sins, doing unintentionally any one of the things that by the commandments of the Lord, his God ought not to be done and realizes his guilt or the sin which he has committed is made known to him, he shall bring as his offering a goat a male without blemish. Oh, it's a goat this time. He shall lay his hand on the head of the goat and kill it in the place where they kill the burnt offering before the Lord. It is a sin offering. 
Then the priest shall take some of the blood of the sin offering with his finger and put it on the horns of the altar of burnt offering and pour out the rest of its blood at the base of the altar of burnt offering. And all its fat he shall burn on the altar like the fat of the sacrifice of peace offerings. Chapter 3. So the priest shall make atonement for him for his sin and he shall be forgiven. If any one of the common people sins unintentionally, in doing any one of the things that, by the Lord's commandment, ought not to be done, and realizes his guilt or the sin which he has committed is made known to him, he shall bring for his offering a goat, a female, without blemish, for his sin which he's committed. And he shall lay his hand on the head of the sin offering and kill the sin offering in the place of burnt offering. And the priest shall take some of its blood with his finger and put it on the horns of the altar of burnt offering and pour out all the rest of its blood at the base of the altar. And all its fat he shall remove, as the fat is removed from the peace offerings. And the priest shall burn it on the altar for a pleasing aroma to the Lord. The priest shall make, the priest shall make atonement for him, and he shall be forgiven. If he brings a lamb as his offering for a sin offering, he shall bring a female without blemish and lay his hand on the head of the sin offering and kill it for a sin offering in the place where they kill the burnt offering. Then the priest shall take some of the blood of the sin offering with his finger and put it on the horns of the altar of burnt offering and pour out all the rest of the blood at the base of the altar. All its fat he shall remove as the fat of the lamb is removed from the sacrifice of peace offerings and the priest shall burn it on the altar on top of the Lord's food offerings. And the priest shall make atonement for him for the sin which he has committed and he shall be forgiven. We'll come in chapter 5 to some more regulations about what you do for various kinds of sins. Why does God require that an animal be killed in order to atone, to cover, to cover for sin? Because without the shedding of blood, yeah. But was all of that blood of bulls and goats satisfactory? Was it adequate? Was it enough? to atone for sin. No, the blood of a sinless sacrifice would be required. And one day that blood would be shed for you and for me. Did these, did these sacrifices for sin, were they costly to the people? Yeah, I don't know how many times you have just thrown away a good bull or a good goat, but that's a, that's a costly sacrifice. Sin bears a tremendous penalty. All of that would be obvious to the people of Israel as they worked their way through these Levitical requirements that would thankfully point forward to one who would come and give his life for us. Thank you. Thank you for your attention to Leviticus. Thanks, Don. We'll continue in song with number 409. I need to apologize to those of you that... Uh, have enlarged copies that's not included tonight. I thought tonight was a congregational meeting, and so I only picked two songs. But we're going to put a third one in to follow up the scripture this evening. I know whom I have believed, number 409. I'll invite you to join me in standing together as we sing these four verses.
you sing that chorus one more time without the instruments with me? Can we have the words back up there just to make sure? Or not. There we go. Let's do it together. But I know who my special in song now.
Thank you. Brian, we should include that in your funeral service. No, Brian's out there. Janice, we should include that in Brian's funeral service. Keep that, take a note. It's not, we haven't planned it yet. Just in case you're wondering. We've been studying the Joseph story together since uh, March. And if I wanted to gather up the the theme of the Joseph story in Genesis in just one sentence, I would say, God was with Joseph. I know we're going to be in chapter 47, but stop with me just for a moment in Genesis 39. Genesis chapter 39, that theme shows up three or four times just in chapter 39. Again, for me, the Joseph story, that whole section at the end of Genesis that we're in, the middle of, would be encapsulated by a phrase, just a simple sentence, God was with Joseph. Chapter 39 starts out like this. Joseph had been brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard, an Egyptian, had bought him from the Ishmaelites who carried him down there. Now look at verse 2. Chapter 39, verse 2. Yahweh was with Joseph. And he became a successful man. He was in the house of his Egyptian master, Potiphar. Verse 3, his master, Potiphar, saw that the Lord was with him. The Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. Now, you remember that Potiphar's wife made a play. She was chasing after young Joseph, and he fled, and she lied, and he got in trouble. I'll take a look at same chapter, chapter 39, verse 20. Having listened to his wife, verse 20, Joseph's master, Potiphar, took Joseph and put him into the prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there, Joseph was there in prison. But, verse 21, the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison put Joseph in charge of all the prisoners who were in the prison. Whatever was done there, he was the one who did it. The keeper of the prison paid no attention to anything that was in Joseph's charge. Why? Because the Lord was with him. Whatever he did, the Lord made it succeed. So there's a theme over these past four months together in Genesis. The Lord was with Joseph. And that'll characterize our text tonight in Genesis chapter 47. I intend to save some time at the end of the service. No guarantees, that's my intent. I intend to save some time at the end of our service tonight for you to respond to the question, when have you really recognized that God was obviously with you? And sometimes that recognition only happens after the fact. I understand that. So sometimes we look back with beautiful hindsight and say, It was really clear to me during that phase of my life that God was with me. And I and again I say I hope to give some time for you to give give praise to God just briefly for a time when it was obvious to you that God was with you, just as God was with Joseph. So that means, Noah, we might want a handheld microphone if I get to that. Good man. I'm in Genesis chapter 47, beginning in verse 13. This is where we left off four or five weeks ago uh, when we were last in Genesis together. Genesis chapter 47, verse 13. Now, there was no food in all the land, for the famine was very severe, so that the land of Egypt and the land of Canaan languished by reason of the famine. Why is there no food in all the land? Huh? Huh? Drought? I mean, like for a few months? Seven years? Seven years of drought? How did that come to be? God made it happen. Just like everything else, God made it happen. Yeah, our our confidence in God's sovereignty makes an explanation of that. But God had, through Joseph's dream, had predicted, no, excuse me, through Pharaoh's dream, had predicted seven years of plenty, there we go, and seven years of famine. 
And so when Joseph interpreted Pharaoh's dream that indicated there would be seven years of plenty followed by seven years of famine, Pharaoh put Joseph in charge of the grain storage program. And they started during those seven years of plenty gathering grain with a view to surviving the seven years of famine. And so we've been through the seven years of plenty and Egypt has stored up an uncountable amount of grain. And now we're working our way through the seven years of famine. And that's why I read in verse 13, there was no food in all the land. That's because we're now in these seven lean years. So what Joseph is going to do in our passage tonight was planned by Joseph, known by God, but planned by Joseph eight or nine years ago. Joseph made a plan before the seven years of plenty began that he now is executing. We're probably a year or two, I imagine, into the bad years, into the lean years, because there is now no food left in Egypt. I suppose the first lean year, you might have had something to eat from last year. So we are eight or nine years away from the original plan to store and then eventually dispense, disperse food. Verse 14, and Joseph gathered up all the money that was found in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan in exchange for the grain that they bought. And Joseph brought the money into Pharaoh's house. Who's giving Joseph money? Everybody. Everybody is giving Joseph money. Why are they giving Joseph money? Because they're hungry. It's the same thing you do when you go to Aldi's or Walmart or Family Fair or some other grocery store. You trade money for food, right? Why? Because the old mother's old mother Hubbard's cupboard is bare and the refrigerator's empty. It's time to get something to eat. So the people of Egypt and the people of Canaan were all trading money for food. Look at verse 15. When the money was all spent in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan, would you spend every bit of money you had for food if you had to? Yes. What would you possibly want to save money for if food you needed? I appreciate that we want to save money for another day, but if, if food is what you needed and you had money available, you would spend it. I believe, unless you're some sort of a fruitcake. I would think that you would spend any amount of money necessary to keep food in your belly as much as you wanted it. So all the money, verse 15, is spent in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan. All the Egyptians came to Joseph and said, give us food. Why should we die before your eyes? For our money is gone. And Joseph answered, what else you got? He said, verse 16, give your livestock. I'll give you food in exchange for your livestock if your money is gone. So they brought their livestock to Joseph, and Joseph gave them food in exchange for the horses, the flocks, the herds, and the donkeys. He supplied them with food in exchange for all their livestock that year. And you don't want to give up your favorite horse. I understand that. But when it comes to giving up your favorite horse or having food, the horse has to go. Either that or you have to eat the horse. But the hope is you can trade that horse for more food than the horse would provide. So now all the money is gone. Now all the livestock is gone. Now where do we turn? Look at verse 18. When that year was ended, they came, the people of Egypt and Canaan, they came to him the following year and said to him, we will not hide from our Lord that our money is all spent. The herds of livestock are my Lord's as well. There's nothing left in the sight of my Lord but our bodies and our land. Why should we die before your eyes, both we and our land? Buy us. Make us your slaves. Buy us. Buy our land for food. And we, with our land, will be servants to Pharaoh. Give us seed that we may live and not die, that the land may not be desolate. So Joseph bought all the land of Egypt for Pharaoh. For all the Egyptians sold their fields because the famine was severe on them. 
the land became Pharaoh's. As for the people, he made servants of them from one end of Egypt to the other. Only the land of the priests he did not buy, for the priests had a fixed allowance. These are Egyptian priests, had a fixed allowance from Pharaoh and lived on the allowance that Pharaoh gave them. Therefore, they did not sell their land. Wow, these are desperate times. So you've withdrawn all the money from your 401k and you've bought food with it. You've now sold off all of your possessions, all the stuff, your favorite John Deere tractor, your boat, your truck, your motorcycle. I'm sorry. You've sold all that stuff off now you've run out of that to sell, so now what do you have left? Property. For some of you, it's just a few acres. For other, others of you, it's hundreds. I guess you sell it. You got to eat. And when it comes right down to it, I'd rather be Pharaoh's slave and have food than to be free and be hungry. That's the conclusion they came to. The only exception was Joseph's wife's relatives. Remember, he, he married the daughter of a priest. I don't suppose that has anything to do with it. He doesn't seem to be that kind of a guy. But the Egyptian priests were able to maintain possession of their lands because they had a regular stipend from Pharaoh. How far are we into this famine now? Let's assume at the beginning of our passage tonight, we were in year the beginning of year two of the famine. So in year two, they sold their, they gave away their money. In year three, they gave away their livestock. In year four, they gave away their land and themselves. So we've got, I think, at least two, maybe three years of famine left. You know, everything that they had belongs to Pharaoh, including themselves. Take a look at verse 23. Joseph said to the people, Behold, I have this day bought you and your land for Pharaoh. Now here is seed for you. Go sow the land. We must be getting close, I suppose, then, to the end of this time of famine. And the harvests you, excuse me, and at the harvests, verse 24, you shall give a fifth to Pharaoh. Four fifths shall be your own, as seed for the field and as food for yourselves and your households and as food for your little ones. And they said, you have saved our lives. May it please my Lord, we will be servants to Pharaoh. So Joseph made it a statute concerning the land of Egypt, and it stands to this day, I suppose this day means when Moses wrote this, that Pharaoh shall have the fifth, the land of the priests alone, did not become Pharaoh's. It's kind of a feudalistic system, isn't it? So the the people of Egypt and the people of Canaan have become serfs. And these serfs got to keep 80% of what they grew. 80%. Now, some of you and many of your friends would be glad to pay only 20% of your total income as tax, wouldn't you? How many would be glad if you only had to pay 20% total income of your, of your income in tax? I would too. You just think about what we pay to the federal government what we pay to the state government for income tax and sales tax, what you pay to the local government for property tax, you put that together, I think we'd be happy to pay 20%. Unless you're at some ridiculously low income bracket where apparently you're not paying any taxes. Right, Abby? So I think this 20%, 80% deal is really pretty sweet, is it not? Pharaoh gives them They've sold their land. They don't own anything anymore. He gives them seed to plant and allows them to keep 80% of the produce of their fields. I think that's a pretty sweet deal. So Pharaoh and Joseph as Pharaoh's representative, Joseph's not being a real stinker, I don't think. He's not taking advantage of them by this arrangement. As a matter of fact, the Egyptians seem totally pleased by it. Look at verse 25. You saved our lives. We'll be your servants forever. Is there a parallel to our day? Do you trade money for food? Yep. Every week at the grocery store or wherever it is you pick up your groceries. For food? 
Well, I suppose you'd sell what you have to, right? Those of you who are raising livestock, if, if uh, Johnny or Missy was here tonight, they'd be able to respond to that. Yep, we trade livestock for food. We put food on the, save by, on the table by selling longhorns. Uh, do you trade yourselves for food? Yeah, those of you who have a job, right? You're, you're trading your labor, your effort, your time, your uh, feeling good and not so achy. Some of you, you go to work and you come home achy, right? Just the way work is. So you're, you're, we're doing the same kind of thing today. Think about how life is with Joseph in charge. Joseph's in charge of this famine management uh, for these seven lean years. With Joseph in charge, Pharaoh prospered, right? The Egyptians stayed alive. Joseph's family survived really well. And people all over the then known world, throughout Egypt and Canaan, people stayed alive. Joseph gathered up all the money that was found in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan. They fervently rummaged in the mattress, in the coffee can, in the backyard, in the bank. <clears throat> there was a bank run that year. They fervently rummaged for all the cash they could find. He gathered up the livestock, the horses, the flocks, the herds, the donkeys. He gathered up all the land of Egypt except what the priests had, and he gathered up the people. Was Joseph wise? Yeah, from where did that wisdom come? James says in James chapter 1, verse 5, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all men liberally, yes, and without reproach. Wisdom comes from God. It wasn't too many months ago that pastor had us in Proverbs chapter 2 where wisdom is available for those who cry out for it. Is the wisdom available for us as well? Yeah, but Joseph had wisdom from God. I wonder if things were this desperate in Goshen. The land of Goshen, remember that's where Joseph's family is. Jacob and his 70 are there in the land of Goshen. I wonder, are things desperate in Goshen like they are in the rest of Egypt, like they are in Canaan? Have Joseph's father and brothers and their kids traded their money, their livestock, their land, and themselves for food? Perhaps we'll have time after our congregational meeting next Sunday night to come to a, a bit of an answer to that question. I hope we can, at least. When have you really recognized that God was obviously, as with Joseph, at least with hindsight, with you? Noah has a microphone. He'll be glad to bring it to you. I only ask that because I want to be able to hear you and I want others to be able to hear you as well. And maybe none of you have a time you can think back on when it was clear to you, at least as you look back, that God was with you. But if you do, we'd be encouraged by hearing about that. Okay, Noah, take that over to Mrs. John. Please. Thanks, Margaret, for getting us started. Did you turn it on? Take a look at it, Noah. Press. Oh, it should be on. There we go. Thanks. Go ahead, Margaret. When my husband passed away in 2002, and I was left with a mortgage and a car payment and didn't know how I was going to pay for anything. And um, the Lord supplied all my needs, and he has in the last 21 years. Yeah. And I'm just so, so grateful because I could not have done it without him. That's right. You look at that crisis and you think, how am I going to get through right. the Lord's faithfulness? Faithfulness. Very Amen. Much so. Thank yeah. you. When have you, when has it been clear, Steve? Steve Stampler, Noah. When's it been clear that God was with you? Um, back in the 80s, or when my dad committed suicide, and I was without a job and just feeling relieved that God stepped in and showed me the way. Yeah. And still does today. He does. Yeah. Without just, question. Amen. 
Mary. Thanks, Dawn. About the same as Margaret, uh, when my husband passed away, it was it was uh, 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 quickly within ten days. All of a sudden, he's gone, and it was a shock to me to be alone all of all of a sudden. And then um, I just knew that I started reading the scripture, and God is my husband, and all that, and I had to start trusting Him. Yeah, and that was. Uh, the beginning of getting a little more mature spiritually. So I am appreciate that that happened now yeah. in a way uh, because of it drew me closer to the Lord. That's right. It's, the, it's those kind of crises that get us opportunity to trust God in ways that we haven't had to before. Amen. Thank you. Who else? A time when you look back and you say, yep, God was really with me. Catch Margaret while you're there. Uh, forward to your right, Margaret Armstrong. Thanks, Noah. This, is, this goes back <clears throat> a long way. When my kids were teenagers. They were on a bus coming home from a ball game. I mean, some, ga some game they had in another town, and it was winter. And the storm came up after they left Hastings. And so when my husband came home, the roads were terrible. He said, I'm not going out again tonight. And so I said, well, I guess I am. I didn't, I had just a car. So I took off and I went through more, more snow drifts than 10 people should. I got, I tried to cross Rogan Road and I, it stopped. And I couldn't get it started again. And I walked to the neighbors and went home. So I'm back to the car. <clears throat> I was hoping, I didn't think anybody else was dumb enough to be out <laughs> that was going to hit my car. And so I I tried to start it again. It wouldn't start. And I sat there, sat there. Finally, I said, I'll try it again. It, it, it started. But I had no heat. I had no windshield wipers. I had the window down. <laughs> I drove all the way into Hastings with my head out the window. <laughs> and... But, and I finally got there and pulled into a gas station. And this poor guy, he dug down. My whole engine was full of snow. He dug, dug down and got the belt and put the belt back on. My kids finally got back to Hastings. I picked them up. And by that time, the snow plow had gone through part of 37, mm -hmm. and we got home. I had to bring home a kid with us that didn't have a place else to go, but we got home. And, you know... You don't think of it at the time because you're going on your own strength. Right. And afterwards, it had to be God. That's right. There was no reason why, you know, we started. So. That's right. Yeah, line, he was lining up all those things that were necessary. Yep. Nice. There's another hand, but I lost it. Alice Sleeman, Noah, if you can get to her. Well, he'll get you a microphone. That'll help us. Go ahead, Alice. I think of, think back of all the times that uh, Don has been real bad. And in 2016, I think was the worst. And for 16 weeks, I know 14 weeks he missed church, and that was awful for him. And I became a full-time nurse at home, and I had no idea what I was doing. But I learned real fast, and I know that was because God... Mm saw me through it yeah. because I had to keep charts and I had to change tubes and I had to do everything. Well, I didn't do it. God did it. Yeah. He gave me what I needed at the time. That's right. And it was so scary because we thought he was going to go. And he's given me strength now to still take care of him. That's right. Yeah. As a matter of fact, you and Don have been, have received strength of God to take care of one another, right, Don? Because she's a lot of work, too. <laughs> what you mean? <laughs> Thanks, Alice. A time when you look back and you say, yep, obviously God was with me. Glenna, come on up, Noah. I'm glad we have a young guy in the booth tonight. Thanks. Go ahead, Glenna. 
Well, my story um, goes back a long time, too, back to 1967 when I was a senior in high school. And um, I wanted to become a nurse. So I was supposed to do an entrance exam in uh, Kalamazoo, a big city of Kalamazoo, mm -hmm. <clears throat> at uh, Western Michigan University. And my brother, Ken, had agreed to drive me along with my mom. And we woke up. It was 20 below uh. that day. And so... Well, you know, cars don't like to um, <clears throat> run in 20 below, but we got partway across Schultz Road, and the car stalled, and they, you know, Tan managed to get it started again, and we got it as far as Dalton to a service station, and they got it started again. So he has, you know, Ken thinks that he's in charge, and I'm afraid. <laughs> And uh, he said, what do you want to do? you want to go back to Hastings or you want to try to make it to Kalamazoo? And I said, you know, I, I, I want to go to Kalamazoo. So we got to Kalamazoo, and it quit on Michigan Avenue. And that time they towed it to a service station. Well, the service station happened to be just um, by Michigan, you know, Western Michigan University. And I looked at my mom, and I said, I think my, I'm supposed to take my test around here somewhere. That's right. So we walked up to where I was supposed to take my test. I took it, passed, and the car was toast, but, you know, <laughs> I, I knew that the Lord was with me. Yeah. So, yes, it's funny to hear you say your brother thought he was the one making this happen. That's right. You knew better. Well, you know, and through the years, when you learn to trust in the Lord, yeah. you know, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 is my life first. Yeah. Once you learn that, you know, God is really the one in control, then you can rest in that. Amen. I do too, right? Okay, go ahead, Roger. You know my life verses Isaiah 40, 31. Yep. Those who wait upon the Lord. Yeah. Many times I've had to look back and say, thank you, Lord, whether I was getting shot at or left in a burning house or as a firefighter or whatever. But probably the most important thing other than salvation is the fact the Lord impounded on my heart that I should ask Glenna to marry me and be my life partner. Yeah. And that's working. How many years ago? 49 and a half. Almost 50. Almost 50. Yeah. So. Yeah, God has been with you. He gives us peace. Does. Amen. Who else? Donna Ashley. Al, who was with you this morning? And his wife. Thank you. When I graduated from high school, I was only 16. What was I going to do? We had no money, nothing to do. And then I suddenly heard there was a county normal in Hastings. Well, how was I going to get there? I got permission to ride the Hastings bus, even though I was in the Dalton School District. And from there, my whole life changed yeah. from the very fact that I could get to the county normal and graduate and do all the things that the Lord had led me to do. Right. Able to do something you weren't supposed to be able to do. Yes. Yeah. Amen. At, six, at 16, that was something. That was a few years ago. Yeah, quite a, yeah, quite a few. <laughs> Thanks, Donna. Dennis, oh, when, when Al's done, Dennis Bernal. Go ahead. When I came with RBM <clears throat> in... December of 1957. It's many years ago. It is. And <clears throat> June and I served, and they. one of the things that happened is that the director wanted to st see about doing some work in Arizona. So June and I went out to Arizona in 1980. 82, <laughs> and uh, found out they did not have a law out there. And so there is an opening in Jackson County, and they asked if I would come back and serve in Jackson County. And I was fearful because that's the county where I grew up in. Yeah. Well, the people knew me. Yeah, I know the feeling. And, and I thought, Will they accept me? <laughs> and so we said yes, and we served in Jackson County 
And then June passed away in 87. Yeah. Yeah, okay. In June of 87. And I thought, what should I do now? Find a wife. I tried. It didn't work out. <laughs> there was a group in Jackson that invited me to come. And uh, there was some women there, but none. I had to be careful because I knew that in the ministry, I had to be careful about who my wife was. I didn't want to be kicked out of the ministry because I'd done something dumb. <laughs> and so when June was passing away, she said, now, I want you to get married. She knew I couldn't live by myself. <laughs> and I said, do you have anybody in mind? <laughs> she said, yes. But she wouldn't tell me who it was. And her and Donna had worked together at Camp Cook for 12 years. So she knew Donna. And I talked to my kids about it. And my daughter, Sandra, said, I think she might have met Donna, but I'm not sure. So I started to investigate the possibility. Mm. <laughs> so I asked, I called Donna and I asked if she'd like to go to the tabernacle for a meeting at, in the end of the summer. I said, yes. So we went, you know where those stagecoach in is out I do. Richland? I do, where it was, yes. Where it was? Well, we met around a booth, and we met there. Then we went to, the, went to the conference. Had a lot of questions I asked her. Had... <laughs> And found out, yeah, I asked her if she had anybody on the string. <laughs> you know how it is. I wouldn't want to break up another friendship. Yeah. And things went on, and she told me later, she talked to Pastor Branham, and she said, I'm afraid he's going to ask me to marry him. What shall I say? <laughs> and Pastor Branham said, huh? And Pastor Branham said, what did he say? Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so I finally got it, finally got it up there. She had a choice. I was thinking about taking flying lessons at Jackson. Yeah. And so I had a choice. The flying lessons were going to cost about $2,500 to get your pilot's license. You had to choose between that and marrying Donna. Yeah. <laughs> so I had the choice. Do I go ahead and do the pilot license or get married? Yeah. <laughs> I think you chose well. Well, <laughs> I finally broke loose and asked her if she would marry me. And at first, she kind of hesitated. Yeah. <laughs> and I thought, oh, no. <laughs> Well, she'd been, she'd been single for 56, 57 years. Yes. It's hard to imagine being married. And you, know, and you know what happened when we asked to use the church. I won't go into that. Good. <laughs> and that's been 36 30, years. Yes, yeah, 35 years last spring. 35 years. Dennis Merlau, you're next. not one thing for us, for me. Um, we'll get there. Uh, you know, accepted Lord probably when I was, I don't know, 16 or something like that. And then married, and did I follow the Lord and everything I did? Nope. Uh, hooked up with Deb. Married, not hooked up. Married. <laughs> yeah. You, you know, married she, up. You know, and she's, she's been strong, and she's been stronger than me. But we finally come, I finally come to just give it over to the Lord. What 
whether it's finances, uh, raising kids, etc., and how God has provided for us immensely. I'm wealthy. Nope. I'm wealthy in my eyes. I'm a happy camper. Yeah. But God has provided for us and still confide, nice. provides for us. And it's not one thing someplace. I'm not knocking the folks for what they're saying, but it's not. I know with us, it's just been a continual grow. And you wake up in the morning, what's God forgot for us That's today? Right. With my health issues over the years, you know, I'm doing good now. But I mean, Deb has been there. God showed his hands immensely. Yeah. And you, you've been around what's going on and so am I going to say it's one thing no just prove me and see that I'm good yeah and God has made that promise and so as what I end up do with other people and whatnot we just try to instill that learn that young yeah God has promised and you see it every day if you look for it you will and when you think you've accomplished it by yourself you're fooling yourself right God has promised Right. And as we get older and challenges still come up, there's no doubt. But God has promised. Do we know what that is? No, we don't. But if you have your eyes open and you look for it, you're going to see what God has promised is true. Yeah. So, I, would I change? You think, well, I can make it. You know, people think we can make it on our own. Yeah, maybe you could for some ways, you know, but but you, we try to talk this word, find rest in me. Christ tells us to find rest through him. And people, they don't understand. Right. But if you really will give it to God, the rest is there. He has promised. Yeah, and he is faithful. Yeah, and so, through it all. like I say, it's not one thing, it's just, whole lot of things it was it finally the biggest thing is learn early to give it over to the lord right and and keep at that that's right you have to keep giving it up again and again thanks for your participation tonight an encouragement to hear not just that god is with joseph and that he is used but god's with us as well thanks for your for your tales i mean that in a very positive sense i appreciate that let me take a moment and pray with you before we go father we're grateful again tonight for the opportunity we've had to think again about how you're using Joseph and not using him because he's so special, but Lord, you're using him because you're so special and you're with, you've been with him. We've seen that now for three months. We ask that you'll help us to understand that in our own lives just in the days to come. Father, may we be those who recognize early and often that you're in charge and that we can trust you because you are faithful. Praying for this in your son's name. Amen. Thank you.